Hello everyone. Welcome back to another edition of 100% Isolated. Um, today we are going to be speaking to uh, Anna Calvi. Um, it's a friend of mine that I haven't seen for quite a while now. Um, I'm looking forward to catching up with her um, about her her work and what she's been up to. So we're just going to wait for her to join, which hopefully won't be very long. And uh, in the meantime, I hope you all, everyone's well. Um, hope you're all coping well with the uh, continued lockdown. Um, I'm just waiting for Anna to join us. Um, so we should just, oh, there we are. She's joined us, so there we go. Anna. Just waiting for Anna to join. Hello. Hey. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm all right, thank you very much. Yeah. Are you at home? I'm at home. Yeah. It's been so long since I last saw you. Like... Yeah, it's been quite a long time, actually. I think the last time I saw you was at the Mercury's. Oh, yeah. In 2014. Oh, wow. So who were you playing with then? Polar Bear. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got hmm. nominated twice, sort of 10 years apart from each other. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah how are you doing good yeah just uh hanging around you know not yeah. really doing that much hey, how are you coping with the um isolation um i feel like it's quite similar in a way to writing an album you know mm -hmm. it's like you don't really do you sort of don't go out much and you just mm. work in your house so yeah. in that way it doesn't feel that different yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you um you writing us you working on stuff? Yeah, I'm I'm um writing my next record kind of. Right. Yeah. And is that something you plan to you're planning to do anyway, or have you just thought once we just get on with it? Uh yeah, no, I was doing it before this stuff happened. Oh right, okay. Yeah. So, so it's just giving you added focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you, you have no excuses to to not do it really. Like, yeah. There's no distractions. Yeah, <laughs> but how do you how do you find that? Because I find if I'm doing that, I need to be able to go to the cinema. Or I need to be able to go to go for a walk or something. I suppose you can still go for a walk, but do you find that the the that, lack of yeah that part is hard because it's like a well that you need to fill. Like mm. you need to have inspiration to be able to write something, and and uh, that is tricky. Because the only way now really is to like look at screens as in watching mm. films. And it sort of feels like creativity is always better when a screen isn't involved, I find. <laughs> you know? Right, yeah. Um, so that's definitely been tricky. Mm. Uh, what have you been doing like since lockdown? Well, I've got these projects that I've been working on that I had a bit of a tragedy, tra tragic hard drive situation that happened oh. in February when my hard drive died and I had to get it back and it took them like two months to get it back. So they, I had these projects that were meant to be finished like, and, I, and they, they got it back and I managed to get all the stuff back. So now I'm sort of just sort of desperately trying to get those things finished so that I can get on with the other things I'm supposed to be doing now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Writing new music basically, you know, yeah. <laughs> I sort of had these little projects to, to do in between finishing the last album and starting the next one. Uh, but now that that's spilled out, spilled over into the time that I should now be writing the new one. So now I'm trying to write some new stuff as well as finish these old things. It's all getting a bit cluttered. Right, right. So I just kind of need to get them out of the way so I can mm. kind of get on. But then I keep writing things. I, I think because my head's already in the next album, I keep writing things for this previous project. And I think, well, that would be good on my on my album so I sort of I keep thinking I'm making progress for the old project but I'm using them using them for the new stuff <laughs> I'm not right. making any progress at all right, it's all right. quite confusing and messy <laughs> there we are <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was gonna I was gonna ask you about that because um when I when I'm writing now I'm sort of doing quite a lot of producing really recording and, and sort of doing things with, with, with screens and makes it logic but it mm. sounds like you, you don't write that way is that Oh, I mean, I, I do actually <laughs> have been said all that. I use yeah. um, Pro Tools. And, right, um, okay. I, I think like the, the tricky thing is to try and always surprise yourself, to try and find new ways of mm. 
hearing a guitar or hearing something. Um, and the way that I have been trying to do it recently is using another instrument and pretending it's a guitar. Mm -hmm. Like I've um, like a little uh, micro -corg keyboard mm -hmm. and I just distort it up and I sort of imagine that it's a, a guitar with the idea that I would later um, replay it on a guitar, but I just like the fact that it makes me play different notes and stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, always, it's always hard, especially when you, you know, you have your thing that you do on your instrument mm. to try and always come up with new ways of doing it. Mm. Do you yeah, find yeah. that on the saxophone? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm getting to that stage now where I'm starting to write new stuff and I've got to go so many times. <laughs> something else but like, all the acoustic aid lad stuff is all written on the piano oh really so oh. yeah for that same reason um so i don't know i'm sort of in between really at the moment. But, right. but do you do you find that can you can you play where you are can you play guitar where you are i um i did a, a live gig a couple of weeks ago it was just two songs from my from my bedroom and I really right. felt like, just like, I'm really sorry, neighbours, you're just gonna have to put up with this. For me. Yeah. Like, um, but it is, it's tricky to be, to be really loud, for mm. sure, when you're in the flats. But yeah. with, with the guitar, I, I, um, I guess I don't, I just don't play it that loudly, but it's definitely not the same as being able to like, plug in and turn up to 10 and yeah, really go for it. Yeah, because I was going to say, like, a lot of your sound and the way you approach the guitar, it's got that sonic quality, isn't it? Yeah. So if you can't, if you, if, when you're writing, okay, so you're not, do you ever write with a guitar? Or is it always I do, writing? yeah, no, I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. So when you do, do you just kind of, like, try and imagine what it would be like if it was <laughs> full volume? Or you just, like, plug the guitar into the computer and sort of do it in the box and just... Yeah, just... Like have your headphones. Have your headphones really loud. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I do. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And try and replicate that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you about. I've been asking everyone about their process because um, you don't often find people's process. People talk about the process very much in interviews, but people are sort of promoting their work or their work. And I was going to ask you how you approach writing a song. Is it different every time? It's always like when I do it, I can't remember how I did it last time, and it always freaks me out. It's like, um, and I, I think it is, it is different in some ways. In some ways, I always do the same thing, and like I record something, and then I put it away, and I just don't listen to it for like a month or something. Because mm. I, I, I used to listen to things straight away, and I noticed that I would always have the same thing where I would think it was amazing, and then next day I would think it was terrible and mm. then I would just give up mm. um, and so a lot of the songs like say for my first record I, I had recorded like on a tiny little six track recorder and I, I'd forgotten that I'd even written them because obviously at the time I hadn't thought anything of them and it was coming back and then hearing them again and hearing mm. there was something in there mm. so I try and reproduce that 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 distance gives you the closest that you can come to to having a more objective ear mm. i think the, the, the thing that's always difficult i think is like knowing when something's good or not mm. because um just because you feel something when you write it doesn't necessarily mean it's good if mm. you think it's crap when you're writing doesn't necessarily mean it's bad mm. like it, it's very hard to to know there's not like um a simple way of knowing the, the quality when you're doing it and I always find that very mysterious yeah but like when you're in the studio and you're doing like if I do like a vocal take and as I'm doing it I'm like oh my god this is so amazing and I'm feeling so much and I almost feel like I'm gonna cry this must be the most amazing vocal take and then you go in, into the the room and you listen back and you're like oh yeah you know, that actually the one where I didn't really give a shit and I was thinking about yeah. being hungry was actually a better Mm. vocal take it's so hard weird. to trick, trick yourself isn't it to sort of not kind of care so it's like you've got to give it a sideways gl glance yeah or like that. 
It's a bit like trying to get a cat to come and sit on your lap or something, isn't it? Sort of, <laughs> if you really want it to, it's That's just going to run away. Yeah, yeah. I get the opposite. I I get the I get the while I'm doing it, I'm telling myself it's crap, and right. then later later realise it's good, and I've, I'm even to the point now where I'm really conscious of that. I've got that voice going in my head telling me this like you can't do it, just don't. This is shit. You're just this, it's like this voice. I don't know who it is <laughs> telling me I might as well give up and just God, who the hell do you think you are and what you do? And I've learned to sort of say to it, okay, well. I'm not going to stop and maybe I'll come back to it in a bit and see, you know, mm-hmm. and I'll always come back to it. I did it last night, even last night when I was doing it, and was, my head was just going, this is crap. I'll just put it down anyway. You know, it came out this morning. It's like, oh, I like that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, why can't that voice just be accurate? <laughs> I know. I mean, is that what David Bowie was going through when he was kind of going into the studio and just pressing record and doing and improvising his lyrics? Is that because his voice is that because he's managed to close that gap? I think um, I think a lot of it is like bravery and not wor- not worrying about looking stupid. Yeah. And, and I think um, that 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 kind of inner voice is. I think it's there for everyone, but I think it's mm. maybe louder in some people than other people for for, <laughs> for some reasons that are like nothing to do with how definitely nothing to do with how talented you are mm. and i definitely think that i have it quite loud compared to mm. some people that i know mm. i think like the only thing you can do is sort of like recognize it when it's there almost like mm. give it a name like oh there you are mm. you know mm. um i'm not gonna listen to you but it's very easy to say that but to do it it's mm. really tricky i've kind of figured out over the years because i i've I mean, anyone who's seen a, a few of these, few of these um, sessions, will probably have heard me say this before. But I figured out that when I'm, I, I follow this kind of writing technique. That I, do you know, I'm Diane Warren. Have you heard of Diane? She's yeah. a, yeah, you know, she's like a massive pop, pop writer. She, I read an interview with her where she said that when she's writing a song, she, she's got the feeling of the song that she wants to write. It's just a feeling. So she just presses record and just improvises with that feeling on whatever instrument she's on that day. And doesn't let her brain sort of try and evaluate whether it's good or bad. She's not concerned with that. She's just concerned with getting this feeling out. And that's the only thing she's trying to do. And then she'll come back to it later with a critical mind and not an emotional mind. So she completely, completely um, separates the two processes. Right. So she doesn't have any critical thought at all in the emotional phase. And then she doesn't have any emotional thought in the critical phase. I wish that I could be... Um, that good with separating my emotions. Mm. I don't know if I could do that. Like, you know, sometimes I, I try and do that when I'm in the studio and I'm like, right, I'm just going to go for it and not care and just mm. sing, whatever. But then I often feel like I'm outside myself. And as I'm doing it, I'm like, that was shit. Why did you <laughs> sing that? Or like, what a stupid <laughs> lyric. Or, yeah, it's really hard to. I find sometimes when I'm doing something else, like if I, I've been um, having the guitar on me a lot more actually since lockdown. So Mm. if I'm watching a film or something, I'll have the guitar in my arms and I'll just be playing like whatever, whatever comes to me. And I find that feels like a potential for for writing something without that critical mind because you're kind Mm. of doing it for another reason. You're just doing it. You know, when you're a kid and you play, you're not doing it in any way for like some kind of like career thing. It's just because mm. you love doing it. And obviously mm. I still love doing it, but there there are moments where it's hard that the thing that you once just loved purely just because you loved it now becomes something that also you have to think about, you know, your future and what you want to say as an artist and, mm. you know, it's nice mm. to get back to just enjoying the reason that you, that you started mm. even like I did... I've been I've been like playing the thing the very first things that I ever learned on the guitar I've been oh, have you? playing them this is I find it very cute it sort of brings back all these memories you know yeah like all these um, yeah like all these kind of like 50s um things that my dad taught me that's how I got right. into the guitar right okay or well, little Richard yeah things like that yeah. Johnny be good and yeah stuff. amazing <laughs> yeah. yeah that's so did you did you have a, did 
did you sort of start singing after you started playing guitar or was it around? Yeah, around no, I, I started singing way later. Right, okay. Yeah. So going I mean, back to the source, it's going back to the guitar after you. Yeah. 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 Was the, the saxophone your first instrument? Blue. Oh, really? Okay. The blue, yeah. Right. Yeah. And I got, I took this classical blue, you know, just through the grades. Right. And then I really wanted to join the school jazz band. The teacher was like, well, you can't really play trad jazz on a flute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and I was just like, oh. And then I saw someone walking walking, walking down the corridor at school with a, with a saxophone. And I was just like, that's a good idea. Right, okay. Uh, yeah. And I didn't get one for a while because it's like, you know, you can get a saxophone. From. So I used to sort of sit as mine with the school time. Right. I used to hang out in my school time. Mine to start straight <laughs> <laughs> and then and then got really into rock and roll and uh, you know and and when i did start playing i was really into rock and roll and that's kind of again so i still so i started playing as well rock and roll. Mm. i love that that energy it's incredible i was in a were you ever in a rock and roll band like that? um i mean i was i think the first thing i ever did was like do oasis covers with friends right. from school right okay um and th and, th and then i was in a band where i started writing songs but this was still way before i i was a singer and then right. i was in this sort of punky band cheap hotel which is the band that mm. when we toured together mm. all those years ago yeah um yeah so i don't know if any of those would really be called rock and roll exactly <laughs> <laughs> because it depends how you define Rock and roll, but um... you can hear that in your guitar sound, though. You can hear that that lineage in your guitar sound. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I was really obsessed with Hendrix when I when I first started the guitar. Yeah. So, I guess that's that's always been part of my playing. Yeah. But I also play the violin, so I was really interested in the idea of um, how you play a note, just not what note it, not just what note it is. Mm. Um. Because I feel like that a lot of guitarists don't think about that, mm. and the ones that are d that do are, are the ones that are really soulful. Mm. I had the same. <clears throat> I exactly. Like, funny you say that. I had the same sort of thinking when I was playing with Polar Bear a lot. Was how many different ways can you play this this one note? And I know mm. that on a guitar you have different positions. You can you can make the same note in different parts of the guitar. On the saxophone, it's always in the same position, but you can approach it in lots of different different ways. Mm. And it, that's it's it just that variation of tone is is so like you say it's kind of soulful. You can express so much when you when you have that revelation that you can express so much just with one note. It kind of it makes a lot of I don't know. I think it it helps crystallize a lot of things, doesn't it? Mm. Well, I guess it's in a way instruments are their purpose in a sense is to try and get closest to something that's the most human in you, which kind of mm. isn't the voice. So in all the different ways, because the voice is so, um, it's so full of error in a way, you know, the way it cracks, it's never perfect. Mm. And mm. an imperfection, I suppose, is what, what ex is a way that we express our, our suffering, but not just suffering, but the kind of the most beautiful and the most painful moments. And that's kind of what musical art is for, I suppose. Mm. It's interesting you were saying about um, sitting around playing a guitar, watching films. I've always been so jealous of guitarists being able to do that. I've never <laughs> been able to do that because you can't do that with a saxophone. You can't sit That's true. Yeah. With a saxophone. <laughs> I've always just been like, ah, oh, bloody guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> it's a picture. Yeah. You can, but you can you can play without blowing into it and sort of make noises. It's just really annoying. Oh. No, but um. Yeah, because you see pictures of Hendrix. There's a, there's a picture of Hendrix kind of frying eggs with guitar. Around, around yeah, you do get everywhere. Yeah. You can hear that in his playing and just see that in the, in the way he plays it. It's just so completely him. It's effortlessly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing. And have you ever got into, um, like, Johnny Guitar Watson? And um, who is the guy who did space guitar This this for the 50s? There's, a, there's like the... Was it Johnny Guitar Watson or there's the other, the other guy? I can't remember 
his name T Bone Walker. It must have been Johnny Guitar Watson. He did an album called Space Guitar in the fifties, which sounds like Hendrix. But it's in the 50s. Oh really? Yeah, it's bonkers. I, I'll try and I'll try and find it. It's insane. Right, yeah, yeah. It's like you can't no, believe what you're hearing. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, crazy, crazy to start rock and roll, really wigged out, kind of bizarre, psychedelic rock and roll. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I was funny. I was thinking back to um, just thinking back to that that time um when we saw you with Cheap when we kind of met when you were playing with Cheap Hotel, and then after that when you were doing kind of gigs at the um. Proud galleries and um, oh, yeah. playing at um, what was it the Macbeth and those kind of gigs mm. when you kind of first started kind of your solo kind of career mm. and I've always I was always really impressed with the the level of detail you put into your artwork because there was always the I remember always seeing these flyers these amazing incredible flyers where you obviously spent ages just getting this. And I actually looked for some online before talking to you and I found, I found your MySpace page. <laughs> which is oh, like, you've been, have you been on a MySpace recently? It's like kind of going to a, an old kind of broken amusement park. <laughs> like really strange. And I found some of these old flyers. Um, and some of them are absolutely amazing. Like where you've got, I don't know who it is, whether it's you or someone else, you just, just have, like, in the, it looks like in the bath with all the details written in lipstick on, on the person's back. Yeah, yeah, that was me, yeah. That was you. Yeah. And, and the thing that I, that struck me was that it's like, well, first of all, I was going to say, you know, obviously you were very involved in the artwork then, are you still involved in the artwork now in the same, in the same way, you always kind of kept that going? Um, I guess it, evolves like you know working with different people like every time I do a record it's different like for one breath my second record I actually went to Mexico to to shoot all the artwork um right. and so that was a very sort of intense thing um and then with this latest record Hunter I worked with Macy Cousins who's a very amazing um photographer and so I guess it's always different depending on the relationship you have with the photographer but it's it's always, you know, starts from um, an idea of, you know, that what, what the music is saying and how to kind of express that visually has always been really, really important to me. Mm. I always had this idea that in all possible ways, my job in life was to serve the music that I made. Mm. And that's what pushed me to do all the things that, you know, as a, as a kind of like introverted person is very... Um, it's, it's a lot to take on, you know, to be playing in front of lots of people or to be um, doing a, like a live radio or live TV or whatever it is. These things are wildly out of my natural comfort zone. Mm. But, but the idea of the philosophy of I do this for my music is almost like a shield that, mm. um, that enables me to go way further than I, than I thought. And um, I guess that starts in a way from you know the artwork and how how to kind of express that but it it has kind of roots in all all manner of things that i that i do because i i'm definitely not the kind of artist that's like i need to be seen i do this because i want attention and i need to be seen i'm actually kind of the opposite like um that's really not my interest in, in, in being in music. So there has to be another way for me to kind of do all these things that are part of the job of being a musician. Mm. I mean, do you, what's, do you have a sort of philosophy for your, your music? Or if you had one, what would it, what would it be? Well, for me, it's, it's always been about the saxophone and about trying to find a way to make the saxophone feel kind of relevant um in today's kind of society as if you like mm. <laughs> um it makes it sound a lot grander than it is but it's just like when you learn to play jazz you're playing kind of quite a, you're taking it's quite a, quite an historical point of view you have to take mm. and you're, you're presenting actually when you're playing you know old-fashioned kind of jazz it is you're you are presenting an, an historic so an amount of historical research you know Mm. you're coming from an historical position so 
you know, I wanted, I've always wanted to find a way to, to play, play in a way that, that would feel as substantial as that, but feel historical, mm. if you like. Um, yeah. So it's just been about kind of, and then just kind of following my nose really with that. I mean, uh, the saxophone has, um, I mean, you definitely made it cool. <laughs> you know, when <laughs> Acoustic Ladyland came out, it was like, oh my God, this sounds like an electric guitar. And I, yeah. I, mean, I was always really amazed yeah. by by the, the sounds that you managed to get out. And like, I mean, mm. what do you think about the fact, like in general and more mainstream culture, the saxophone has made a bit of a comeback, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. like, even like the way that how much... Um, David Bowie used it on Black Star, mm. you know, and even Kendrick Lamar, or like, you know, yeah. it sort of feels like it's it's had a resurgence. Yeah, it feels like its place isn't. It feels like its place in popular music is it, it isn't quite as obscure as it was. Although I would say that the sound on Black Star and Kendrick Lamar, it, it's, it wasn't really altering the sound of it. Very no, much. that's true. It's quite traditional um, sounding. It's using it, yeah, in quite a traditional way, and and I. I guess if you wanted to sort of kind of like put things down to philosophy, I guess my philosophy is that its properties have not really been explored. Like if you, mm -hmm. if you think of the acoustic guitar and then you think of all the things that have been done with the guitar since then, yeah, yeah. I just, I just feel like the, the saxophone has got that much potential yeah. um, and it hasn't really been explored that much. So I'm kind of just following my nose with that. Really, you know? But the yeah. guitar is definitely a very, a very close reference point. You know? Yeah. Especially like Hendrix and sort of thing, because it's the same. We've got the same range, just the same range, and it's also that proximity to the human voice as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Isn't it? mm. Um. Yeah. So I was. Yeah. So I was just looking at those the things, the artwork. And my other question was, did you like invent the character? <laughs> because the artwork, I, I, it struck me that there's a there's. It's not similar, but there's a consistency there from, I mean, these, these things, these uh, flyers are from, well, it must be from like 2008, nine. So mm -hmm. it's, it's like 10 years, 10 years on. And obviously you can see that there's a character there. Did you, did you sit down and invent the character or did it evolve or ha what happened? Um, I think <clears throat> it was just what came out of the music. I sort of didn't mm. really... It was just the natural way. It was like, what, what does the music want? Mm. What do, you know, like, and it just sort of, it just kind of happened, really. Mm. I, I mean, I kind of li I like the fact that it, it wasn't conscious. You know, I mm. feel like it makes it purer or something. Mm. I mean, I, I did have my initial idea. I remember was um, that I wanted to play both the male and female flamenco dancer that was my right. idea and I and I had a flamenco dress made and I also had like a male outfit made and I tried on the male one and I was like oh but this is so much cooler mm. <laughs> to, to to dress up as the guy is so much more fun mm. um and so I gave the skirt to Mally my bandmate and then I and I just kind of assumed this role it just felt really right Mm. And that was kind of the beginning of it, really. Yeah. It's interesting what you're saying about being an introvert and then sort of, because your stage performance is, yeah, it's extreme. It's very extrovert, isn't it? It's extremely mm. expressive. Mm. Um, and do you feel that kind of going into a performance and coming out of a performance, that period where you're going from being an introvert, stepping into the extrovert, is it just the music that carries you through that, or do you have to do some kind of psychological preparation as <laughs> coming down, coming on, and coming off? I think it's it's definitely putting the guitar on my shoulders does something. Right. Yeah. Like going into battle or something, putting yeah. your sword in your uh, yeah, and then and then um, the music. Mm. But I definitely because I on my first record tour I, I hurt my arm I got RSI in my arm and I had to stop playing guitar for for like I can't remember how long it was but for several tours I had to get someone on stage playing guitar for me because I had oh, to wow. rest my arm that and that weird. was such a head fuck because yeah, yeah, you know yeah. all my life I'd been doing it this way and suddenly not only was I not playing guitar but like someone else was assuming that role of me yeah. it felt as if my head was being split into 
to it was yeah. very very strange uh experience and i felt so naked without a guitar being on stage without a guitar mm. is like it's like another level suddenly you've got like what do i do with my arms and how yeah. do i stand and like all these really you know yes. that was really really challenging for me and I, and i didn't feel even though i tried to use it as a way to kind of uh, learn more about performing i don't think i ever really conquered it because as a, soon as i put the guitar back on it was like oh finally <laughs> <laughs> so was that right at the beginning then yeah so it was like on. It was very, very unfortunate. Um, I think it was like one of my first shows on my first tour. I restrung my guitar. Someone restrung my guitar too too high. So the action on the guitar between the strings and the neck of the guitar was too high. And when I ripped into a solo, the next day my arm was just really hurting. And because I had to play every day because I was on tour, I never got a chance to rest it. So yeah. then I just had to cancel that tour and, and, and rest it and then get someone in to play guitar. And it was so frustrating because it was like, you know, I'd waited all this time, spent all yeah. these years building yeah. up to this point, And then it was just like, yeah. no, you know. Yeah. Oh, oh, was... <laughs> oh. But then, you know, like you really appreciate things when they're almost taken away from you. So when, yeah. when I got to play guitar again, I was like, thank you. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. Wow. And so when you're writing, do you, do you, do you, do you start with the guitar? Oh, you don't necessarily start with the guitar, but do you start with the kind of the music, whether it's guitar or, or the Korg or, or, is um, it or... I, I usually kind of sing random words, but I find that the best songs are always the ones where some kind of message comes through in my, in what I sing very very simple lines like most of the lines in my choruses were written exactly you know it was the way that the, the melody first came out right okay so but you do you, do you start with the backing first before you can sing on top of it um or well I would, melody? I would yeah i don't really start with the melody i mean i have tried that a few times but um no, usually I'll be I'll sing along to a backing or some sort like the guitar or, or whatever I'm, whatever I've recorded. So where does that come from, backing? I mean, that's just like if I'm recording, it's just like me playing, putting some guitar down or putting some keyboard down, and then I'll just sing on right. top of it. But do you, do you uh, come from a point of improvising at that when you when yeah, you start all to of it. To yeah, yeah. It's, it's all improvised. Yeah. So do you? Do you mind me asking you about this? No, I like it. <laughs> okay. Because I it. this is the because I just feel like the starting points. I just get I learn learn so much from just understanding how people starting points. Because once you've got something rolling and something going, then you can build a song from there. That's I kind of know how to do that. But what I don't often know how to do is start. So I'm right. I'm interested in how people. How well, people do often. It. This is something I learned actually from doing, because I did the score for the latest Peaky Blinders. Yeah, which is amazing. Um, thank you. Um, Very dark and, series, though. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I often fa found is I would put something down, whether it's like a chord progression or something that for some reason I liked roughly the sound of it. And then I would record something on top of it, say like a guitar on top of it or a voice. And then I would often find that if I muted, if I removed the initial thing, uh, say the chords, removed that and then actually started from the second instrument, it's sort of like a way of getting to an idea that you wouldn't have started with. Yeah. So that you're not always following the same patterns that your fingers mm. or your, your voice always goes, goes to. Mm. And um, just being really ruthless about it. Like... Yeah taking away all the things that you like <laughs> and leaving <laughs> you with the one thing that you think's a bit shit but then somehow that becomes the interesting part um that's interesting so just explore that a minute do you is that something you've always done or you just did for the peaky blinders it's actually, thing it's actually something i learned from doing peaky blinders because because when you do a score it's like the simplest way of expressing that emotion is always going to be the best so it's always about taking away, taking away, taking away until you get the, 
the simplest version that expresses the emotion that you want. Mm. Um, and, and often like you find that what you're left with is something really kind of bizarre and that's what makes it interesting, you know? Mm. So you're actually starting with the emotion. Yeah, I mean, scoring a series, I think about what what they're trying to express in this scene, and and what's really interesting when you're doing a score is you can, if you're, if the emotion is say sadness, and then you write something sad, it just sounds like a soap opera, mm. like it's awful. Mm. It's, it's very it's very strange how you can't you can't overstate. You almost have to do the opposite. So like if it's re like a really really sad scene is like you have to make the music not very sad yeah right it's very it's very it's very weird and did you find that out from trial and error yeah because yeah. i would i would do some piano thing and i would think oh this is so beautiful and moving and then i would play it with the scene and it would be like this is awful this is like <laughs> neighbors or something you know like <laughs> <laughs> so um but it, it's a really interesting thing to learn for songwriting as well, I think. Mm. Just that you can, um, I guess it's always this thing that people often talk about how you can have a pop song that, where the lyrics are really sad, but people dance to it. That seems yeah. to be like the ultimate goal of a lot of pop music is to, yeah. kind of, and I think it's the same in all, all types of art really because even if if you think of like acting when someone is really really angry but they express it in a very reserved way it's more terrifying mm. than if they're yes. shouting and i guess yeah. it's the same with music as well mm. yeah it's interesting that so this is what you're kind of working on now is this the first thing you've written since doing people find us yeah yeah. And is it, does it change the way you're, sounds like you're looking at what you're doing now in a slightly different light because of, because of the Peaky Blinds experience? I think I am a bit, yeah. Mm. Just in that, um, I, I, I think it's just this feeling of trying to keep interested and, and keep being experimental, mm. even if you end up with a song that isn't, at least that the process mm. is exciting to you and, um, and I guess all the, I mean, say when you're writing, do you, do you feel like, are you trying to, do you, do you think about comfort zones and does it bother you? I mean, cause you know, you can write a song that's in your comfort zone. That's beautiful. Does it, mm. is it make it less good if it's in your comfort zone? You know what mm. I mean? Yeah. Um, I don't really I don't, I don't think I ever kind of really go to, I think I'm always just trying to step just outside that. Cause I think I, I just naturally, naturally don't, maybe I should spend, maybe I should be inside my comfort zone more. Maybe I'd find the whole process a lot more enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> cause, Cause I do find it a bit like sometimes a bit torturous, but then that depends on what's going on in my head to be honest. Mm. I am starting to now sort of think, no, come on, you've done that before. You've done that before push it push it a bit harder but I'm I'm kind of producing as well so it's right. and my production kind of abilities are growing slowly so um it's becoming almost like I'm, I'm creating the whole track rather than just writing the the demo or just making something up sort of right. so it's become rather than just like playing the saxophone I'm kind of writing the drum part or I'm programming the drums or something so it's kind of getting used to comfort zones within that as well because I'm dealing with mm. that side of things. Um, so I'm not quite sure where I'm at really right at the moment. I'm in between a lot of different things at the moment. I always seem to be there in between albums, to be honest. I'm always kind of <laughs> harvesting lots of stuff. Mm. Yeah. We're not going to the original. We've got quite a lot of people here. How old were you when you started playing guitar? Says Didier Katz. I was... I think I was about eight or nine or something I started on the violin and then and my my dad had these electric guitars and I I just started playing them and I just thought this is the coolest thing ever you know mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah I've tried to play guitar so many times and I for some reason I had a phase of my life where 
people kept giving me guitars. So I own <laughs> I own loads of guitars. Oh, yeah? I can't play them. Yeah, I've got, I don't know. At one point, I had about eight guitars or something stupid. And I just oh, can't play any of them. <laughs> I, can't, I tried and tried. I just cannot do it. In fact, in lockdown, I was thinking maybe this would be the time where I'd, I'd try, but I haven't, I haven't done it, so. Well, actually, I got given a saxophone for Christmas. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> really? What <laughs> because... did you get? <laughs> well, the thing is, like, I've always wanted to play the saxophone. Like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, like, um, my parents got me one, and they got me, um, what's the big one called? Baritone. Bar no, the one up from the baritone. Tenor. Tenor. So they got me a tenor. It was so heavy, like, I could barely stand up with it. And, like, so then I had to return it to get the next one, which is an alto. alto. Yeah. And this alto one, I mean... It's very yellow and it has gear for music like stamped across it, yeah. which is very unsexy. Yeah. Um, so, but then I, I sort of feel like I can't really do that to my neighbours, just be honking all, all day on like trying to get a, na a note out of my saxophone. Never stop me. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought like, because I'm a singer, like surely this is going to be really easy. Like I've got, you know, breath control and, and then... But even trying to get a note out of it is yeah. just so hard. What reason you like, got? Oh, I don't know, just the ones that came with the... Right, okay. Yeah. So it might be that the reads you've got are too hard. Possibly. Could be because I'm just not very good. I think it's more likely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do, have to, you do have to spend a while kind of... But it's really hard playing it, coming to a new instrument when you can already play another instrument really well. Right. Don't you find? Do you just you just like I just want to tear into this and I can't Yeah, I feel quite impatient, like why am I not instantly really good at this? <laughs> yeah. I get that with guitars, because obviously guitar music is such a big part of my life. And I sort of get a guitar on my neck and I just really feel this like I really just wanna And yeah. it's almost like it's almost like trying to talk with your tongue cut out or your hat your hands chopped off or something like that. Yeah, so, yeah. Can't do it. But I know that I can do it. I know that I could do it in a previous life or something. It's just like I've got this yeah. incredible connection to the instrument. But it would take years of, of faffing about with it to, to get anything out of it. So I just don't bother. You know? Well, I, I could give you guitar lessons and you could give me sax lessons. Well, I think that amazing. would be quite a fair trade-off. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> I'll have to try and dig it out. I, I think it's, um, it's, I've got like a strap somewhere and I've got an acoustic. Do you ever play acoustic? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not into acoustic guitars. No. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've just said said the worst thing there. <laughs> but, oh, no, 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 don't do that. I think I'm going to hang This interview's over. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Why don't you like it? It's the guitars. I just find them, it's like having a conversation with the most boring person in the party and you can't get away. That's what they are. <laughs> they're just like, <clears throat> it's like they only make one sound and they're really fucking hard to play. Like, I don't know why kids when they start guitar they're always given acoustic guitars yeah yeah but, you know it takes so much effort to like you know put your fingers down on it and mm. i mean you know obviously there are some people that make it sound okay like um <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure there's <laughs> so i know what's this thing <laughs> um but you know in general no just so you know. never listen to any music with acoustic guitars in it? If if I hear a piece of music that starts with someone specifically playing the G chord on an acoustic guitar, I'll turn it off. Because right. I have an aversion to it, I can't bear it. It's I don't have that with any other instrument. I would rather listen to, like, I don't know, like a piccolo flute or something. I, I don't know, no offence to piccolo wow. flutes, but do you see what I mean? It's like... yeah. It's quite intense, my dislike. <laughs> <laughs> but what about, um, cause there's, a, there's a video of Hendrix playing acoustic guitar. I know. Wait, so, okay, so he's the one that's that can- That's a 12-string though. Yeah, 12 strings are better. I mean, I, I, could, I could handle a 12-string guitar. Yeah. But, um, not, not, you, not, a, not a normal acoustic guitar. I hate strumming. Uh, yeah, I've got strumming. a version of strumming as well. Yeah. And I was teaching. Uh, I I spent quite a lot, quite a lot of time teaching, and uh, 
you'd get you'd get guys coming in with their acoustic guitars and just sitting there and just just strumming away. And like if they wanted their song to get more intense, they'd just make it louder. Like yeah. strumming louder. And just well, right, the... is that the best you can do? <laughs> oh the worst thing though is when people strum really lightly though. I find that even more annoying. You know, as if like oh this yeah. makes it really emotional and meaningful if I yeah. like, strum it really lightly and bang the side of the the body of the guitar. Yes. Also, like, there was a period during, so, like, when I started writing songs, um, you know, things were going up and up and up, and I was writing better and better songs, and I was listening to, like, the Beatles and, and Hendrix and Jeff Buckley, and then I started listening to a particular singer, songwriter, who had an acoustic guitar, and I, I feel like I don't want to say who it is because it's it feels mean, but she completely destroyed my songwriting for two years because I kept trying to copy this particular singer and her acoustic guitar, mm. the way that she would write songs. And so mm. I feel like I lost a few years of, of learning, of learning how to write songs by listening to the wrong music. So it's... that's really interesting. So, cause I've had that happen to me where I've had my, um, I've had my songwriting destroyed by um, a female um, <laughs> guitar, guitarist. She wasn't playing acoustic guitar. Was it, it wasn't, was it, it wasn't you. No, it wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't you. But I was, yeah, I had a similar thing. So let's just backtrack on that a bit. So you're, you're, you're learning to write songs and you're listening to a lot of music to help you learn how to write the songs. So mm. what is that? Are you transcribing those songs? Are you learning them? No, it's more like if I listen to something, then I, I feel straight after I've switched off a piece of music I've never heard before, I feel like it's somehow it's it's in me. The ghost of it is in me, and if yep. I've been moved by it, then the thing that I write straight after will, in some way, um, be inspired by by that piece of music yes. that, I, that I just heard. Yeah. So the thing is, if you choose the wrong kind of music yep. to listen to, then then you can write really terrible music. Yeah, and it's funny because it's not it's not necessarily bad music that produces that. I mean, I find that with David Bowie. Like, if I listen to David Bowie, and then I try and write a song, I write mm. the worst songs. Mm. Yeah, I don't know why. I guess because he's so singular. Yeah. yeah, that if you try and copy it, it just sounds like a joke. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's incredibly difficult to um, to deal with. <laughs> 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 Apparently, in real life, he was incredibly easy to deal with. But um, yeah, did you did you ever meet him? No, did you? No, no. Have you read that book called David Bowie: A Life by Dylan Jones? No. If you're, do you like biographies? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I'd recommend that book. I okay. I literally devoured it. It's absolutely it's like one of the best biographies I've ever read. It's oh absolutely right! Fucking brilliant. And it's it, you really feel like you've just been hanging out with him after reading it. It's incredible. Oh, amazing. And it really is amazing. And it's basically anecdotes from people that are all around him. Right. I've got lots of very bizarre, very weird, cosmic, kind of weird things going on with David Bowie. <laughs> um, that, that I will talk about another time. <laughs> <It's quite nice. laughs> but um, but that book, yeah, it's quite quite something. And I've noticed you saying quite a lot that that um your that Lad Insane is your kind of favourite album of all time. Yeah. yeah, saxophone in that one. Yep, saxophone is in that one. David Bowie playing the saxophone in it, isn't it? Yeah, he plays saxophone a fair bit, yeah. Some of those albums. Yeah. 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 What do you think of his sax playing? Um, next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, 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 well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, I have mellowed to it over the years, I, I must say, yeah. Um, I, I'm not the biggest fan of saxophone. That one. Right, yeah. It's good that he yeah. gives it a go, though. I mean, it kind of, at least it proves he's human. Yes, but, absolutely. Like, not yeah. literally everything he does is it's incredible. incredible. It's like yeah. the way he danced was pretty bad. And it was like, thank God David Bowie's not a really good dancer, because <laughs> that also makes him more human, that he sort of had a kind of dad at a wedding kind of dance. Well, apparently, according to this book, he was absolutely phenomenal at dancing. He had this uncanny oh, right. way of moving. Yeah, that maybe wasn't captured so well. He had a book, well, by the way, there's someone asking, what's the name of the book? The book is called David Bowie, A Life by Dylan Jones, which I very much recommend. Um, yeah, it's like you've seen a film, of, it's like one of those 
those books. It just doesn't feel. Right, right. And um, he had a long period, didn't he, in the sort of eighties and nineties, where he even he wasn't happy with with his nineties mm. mostly. Yeah. But some of the the stuff in the very early days and things like that. It's, I mean, I guess I'm basing his dancing to give David Bowie a fair hearing. I, I used, I had um, the David Bowie glass tour, glass spider tour spider, on yeah. on VHS, right. which was like, I guess it was like early '90s, and I used to mm -hmm. watch it every morning before going to school. And it mm. was when, like, you know, things weren't going so well in terms of his taste. So maybe, you know, he had some funky dancing because of that. And maybe, mm. you know, a different period. If I'd, if I'd happened to buy a different live video, maybe I would feel very differently about it. Yeah, I think 90s Bowie is, is kind of slightly not the best, not the best vintage. Yeah. <laughs> I did love that video, though. It's very boring. Well, oh, so there's a question here from Melina asking, how many guitars do you have? I have not that many. I think I have like five, four or five. All different? Um, yeah, I, I've got a couple of um, Jags. I've got a, a, two baritones. And uh, then I have my main guitar that I've had since I was 14, which is the one that I always play. My Telecaster. Telecaster. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I find it's... Uh, I, I've tried lots of other guitars, but nothing feels as good as that guitar. Yeah. I think it's, cause it's because I've played it so much over so many years. It's probably kind of melded to my hands now. Yeah, it would have done. Um, yeah. So it kind of feels very natural, that one. Mm. Yeah. And do you, have a similar, do you have a sort of large collection of old amps and stuff like that? As well? Yeah, I have um, this amp that I got, I think, in 2007 or something. That's uh, 1964... Um, box AC30 and it's red and um, I I still tour with it which is I've been thinking it's probably a bad idea because it's gonna I'm gonna it's last probably it's probably gonna uh, die on stage or something which would be bad <laughs> <laughs> do you not have any backups do you not take any sort of backup with you uh, I do I do have a backup that is true. Mm. <laughs> I saw you playing at WOMAD last year, which was amazing. Oh, cool. Thanks. Yeah. I think that was the first. Was that the first time I've seen you play live? I saw you a couple of times last year because I played it with, I play in Nadine Shah's band. Oh, right. Cool. So, yeah, I saw you at the Peaky Blinders Festival. Oh, right. Um, and I also saw you at, um, at WOMAD. And um, the WOMAD show was fucking amazing it's, I, rem yeah. I remember I really every, everything that could go wrong went wrong during that gig i remember like I all really the equipment did. broke and my guitar wasn't working it was one of those you know like really? <laughs> where you just God, have you, to kind you, of make it work people always say this to me when i when i when i say that and they're like, oh you would never have noticed and just like really but honestly <laughs> you would never have noticed oh really was, okay Absolutely couldn't couldn't tell at all. Did you think I was going to say the opposite then? <laughs> well, <laughs> really obvious. No, yeah. no, no. You couldn't tell at all. It was amazing. And um, I had a, I had a, it was just before, like literally, I was with my stepdaughter and we we watched the show and then we went off and afterwards and then um there was this waltzer on the other side of the, of the field. We went in the waltzer and <laughs> the guys operating the waltzer had this, I don't know what they, what was going on with them. They had some kind of death wish or something, but they were spinning these things like crazy and it went on for ages. And I was literally on this waltzer for like 10 minutes. Oh, and she wow. loved it, but I was just like, I was so ill. And afterwards I just collapsed. And it was just oh. the worst, one of the worst experiences of my, <laughs> my life. I did. <laughs> I yeah. But um, there we go. And then the other one was the Peaky Blinders Festival, which was fun. Oh yeah. Did you, did you enjoy that? Yeah, it was it was really cool to see everyone dressed up and stuff. Mm. And also because mm. I feel like, you know, some of them weren't people that maybe would necessarily go to a festival or mm. listen to my kind of music, so mm. it was kind of interesting. Mm. And and it was great because I had um Rich Torley and Jenny Beth came on stage. Yeah. Yeah. That, was, that, that yeah. was great fun. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um we're going to 
we get cut off at six o'clock because we okay. you get cut off after an hour. So if, can we can we hang up and come straight back? Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. So let's do that, and uh, we'll see everyone in a few minutes, a few seconds. Cool. All right. See you in a second. <laughs> see you.